Hi, good afternoon to you all. Thanks, Dolindra, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for being here for the integration track. Today, uh, I'm going to talk in detail about how we can manage transaction in microservices architecture or microservices applications. And uh, as Dolindra already introduced, I'm Anupama Patirage, uh, working at WSO2, mainly in the Ballerina team. So, before moving into the session, I would like to take you through a simple example that we all are exper have experienced before. That is, Jack is going to transfer $1,000 from his account to Tom's account. So, what happens here is, when Jack initiating his transaction, that amount will be debited from Jack's account, account and there will be some database updates at that end. And if that step is successful, then we are going to credit that amount to Tom's account. So in that end also there will be some database rights and if that step also successful, that means both steps are successful, then we, we can say the transaction is successful. Otherwise, let's say any of these steps get failed, then we are in trouble and we need to roll back the entire transaction and otherwise we are in trouble basically. So this is where the concepts like transactions, transaction boundaries or the XA data sources come into the picture. So, before moving into the details, let's first look at what is actually a transaction. Transa according to the definition, transaction is an atomic unit of work that is either fully completed or not done at all. During its execution, transaction will go through different phases or different states. As you can see below, at when transaction is started, it will be in the active state. It is the state where the actual writes to the database or writings to message queues happens. So after that state, if all these operations are successful, then transaction will go through the partially committed state and finally it will get committed. And let's say some of these operations get failed. At that point, we say transaction is failed and it will go to the aborted state and finally transaction is go to the terminated state. This is a normal transaction flow that we all already know. So let's look at what is a distributed transaction. This is a typical example of a distributed transaction where we have a queue and we are taking out some messages from the queue and based on that message, we are going to insert two different records to two different databases. Those two databases are in different environments and since we are dealing with data sources in different environments, we call this is a distributed transaction. And th the important point here is there can be failures at any point of time. So what we need to do is, let's say, we have insert the first record successfully, but when inserting the second record, we get some failure. At that point, we need to revert the insertion for the first record as well. So that is called the rollback of the transaction, and we need to go to the state where the system was before the transaction began. So this is basically a distributed transaction, and only condition here is everything should happen in a single thread context, because we need to maintain the same transaction context across all of these data sources. So then let's go to the actual problem that we are trying to address here. We have a, a different kind of application architectures. As you have heard throughout the, to, in all the sessions today, one is the monolithic applications, other is the microservices applications. Let's say we have monolith where multiple modules or some multiple business components are in the same application. There can be multiple replications of that application, but still all of these business modules or the components are in within the same application or they are running on the same process. As opposed to that, we have microservices where each of these components are now separated. They are running on a different environment or basically different microservices. So when we look at the transaction on those two types of application, this is basically what's happening. As you can see here, there is three components, component one, two, and three interacting with each other. And let's say we need to make sure all of these three components are working on a single business transaction. For example, component one may be interacting with the MySQL database, two is interacting with the Oracle database, likewise. So to achieve that single business transaction, what we need to make sure is we need to maintain the transaction context across all of these components. 
So the transaction context will be maintained, but that is not difficult because we are running in the same process. But when it comes to the microservices, now we have the same component, same business modules, but the only difference is now they are running in different environment, different microservices basically. So still, if they are going to participate in the same transaction or same business execution, we need to make sure all of these components are having a common transaction context. That means we need to propagate this transaction context across these services and most probably that is via the network. So this is the real problem that we are trying to address here. So actually, the or in practical scenarios, this problem can be really worse because uh, as you can see here, there can be multiple microservices which are interacting with each other in a practical business transaction. Here, microservice one is talking to two and three and two is talking to four and four is talking to five and six. So this is kind of typical example that we get in real life applications and there should be a proper mechanism to handle transactions in those kind of business applications. So the solution that I'm going to describe here is based on a specification developed at WSO2. It is an internal specification that we have developed and still it is under development. And we also have a reference implementation of that using Ballerina language. So first of all, during my session, I will go through the key concepts of this specification. And at the later part, I will describe how we implemented this using Ballerina. So there, as you can see here, there can be two ways or two approaches that we have to solve this problem. One is the joint outcome based on an orchestrator. Other one is the joint outcome based on a coordinator. So let's first look at what is this solution joint outcome based on an orchestrator. Here you can see there is a single component or central component which is called orchestrator which is capable of handling this transaction flow. So what we basically do is we instrument this orchestrator saying this is the transaction flow and it, it will be responsible for handling the entire transaction. We have introduced a central process here. The problem is now we, have, we are going against the philosophy of microservices, which is smart endpoints and dumb pipes, which we have described in previous sessions as well, because we have introduced a central process, which is called orchestrator, and it is a, not a dumb pipe, but a smart pipe. And we have moved smartness away from the microservices themselves. So the better implementation would be the joint outcome based on a coordinator. So this specification is all about how we can achieve this using a coordination mechanism. And from here onwards, I will describe uh, th some theories on how we can achieve this. So you can see the concept of sphere of control here. What is actually sphere of control? Let's say th these are the same set of microservices that I showed you earlier, and they need to participate in a single business transaction. So microservice one is initiating the transaction and it is initially have the sphere S1, which includes microservice one only. Then let's say microservice one is going to talk to microservice two and three. Then what we have is an expanding sphere of control, which includes all of these three microservices. Likewise, when some microservice is talking to another one, microservice beyond its own sphere, that sphere will expand. And let's say microservice two is going to talk to microservice four. We have now even bigger sphere, which include all the four microservices. Likewise, at the end, we have a bigger sphere or the complete sphere of control, which includes all the six microservices. So this pro, uh, in this example, initiator is the microservice one and all the other transactions or microservices which participate in this transaction is called participants. So this process of tying together all these microservices into a single unit is called infection. So what happens is when microservice one is talking to some other microservice, that will infect the second microservice. Let's say then that second microservice is talking to some other microservice, it will also get infection. So this process is called infection and output of that infection is a sphere of control which includes all of these microservices. So 
Let's now look at what is this infection mechanism means. Here, the microservice one is starting the transaction, and as opposed to the previous approach, where we have a central coordinator, we don't have such concept here. What we have is separate microservices, which are responsible for managing their own transaction. And each of these microservices has a coordination component. And depending on which microservice initiate the transaction, coordination component of that particular microservice will become the coordinator for that initiated transaction. So that coordinator varies time to time depending on who initiate the transaction. In this example, microservice one become the initiator, so the coordinator component of microservice one will be the coordinator for the entire transaction. Initially, so microservice one will send the start request to its coordinator, and coordinator will return a transaction context. So this is the transaction context that we are talking about that we need to propagate to all the microservices which are interacting with each other. So when coordinator return that context, then microservice one will have that context. And let's say microservice one is going to talk to another service now. It is a business call. And along with this business call, microservice one is sending the context to the second microservice. So that is the number three, request and context. After that, let's say microservice two is now, have a, now received a transaction context, it will analyze that transaction context and identifies where the coordinator is, and it will go ahead and register with that coordinator. So that is basically how that infection mechanism work. And now let's say microservice two is talking to microservice four, where at that point, we need to pass the same transaction context. That means actually microservice two will pass the same transaction context to microservice four, and it will also go ahead and register with the same coordinator. So in this system, what we have now is an initiator and a coordinator, coordinator component, and also several participating microservices, which already registered with the same coordinator. So this process is called the infection. Now we have a sphere of control, and through that we infected several microservices which are participating in the same business interaction. And then what we need is a mechanism to communicate between those services, initiator, coordinator, and the participant. So at the end of the actual business ex execution, they need to come into a conclusion whether to commit the transaction or about the transaction. There is no central party which decide it on behalf of the microservices. So microservices themselves have to come to that outcome. We call this outcome as the joint outcome. And there should be some set of protocols or negotiation rules to communicate different protocol messages between those three parties. So those kind of rules, we call them as agreement protocol. And a set of agreement protocol is called as a coordination type. Now let's look into the details of them. First of all, let's look at how this agreement protocol works. Earlier, we have completed the registration phase. Now it comes to the agreement or the communication phase. Before that communication started, microservices has to do several things. First one is, it, let's say this particular microservice is receiving an incoming transaction context. So what it has is obviously, uh, obviously a unique ID for that transaction. Other than that, it will have a register at URL and also the coordination type. What that means is register at URL is the URL where this microservice can go ahead and register, where it can find the coordinator actually. And the second one is the coordination type. It is actually the coordination type or the protocol supported by the original co or the coordinator, initiating coordinator. So when microservice, to re microservice is receiving this information, it will go ahead and register with the register at URL. And the input for that request is the pro explicit, ex uh, what actual protocol that this microservice is supporting, and also another endpoint for this microservice. That means after that protocol agreement 
phase is finished, this coordinator and this microservice has to communicate with each other. So in order to communicate, coordinator to send some messages to this microservice, there should be an endpoint. So that is the endpoint. So let's say I am this microservice, I am going to tell the coordinator, okay, this is my endpoint where you can send messages to me. Likewise, as a response to that request, coordinator will send another set of URLs where these are the endpoints I can talk to coordinator to exchange the protocol messages. Now that agreement protocol phase, this is how agreement protocol works. Now all the parties know where I can communicate with. After this phase is begin, if started, completed, now all of them can participate in the actual business execution. So I talked about several coordination types or the set of agreement protocols. What are they actually? The first one is the two-phase commit a compensation coordination type and the other one is the compensation type. Let's first look at what is two-phase coordination is. It is actually a communication protocol which is based on the famous two-phase commit protocol. What happens here is uh, several participants participant can support this protocol, but depending on how they're working or interacting with the particular transaction, there can be several sub-protocol under that. One is the completion protocol. It is supported by or used by the participants who have the ability to control the end of the transaction. That means they, those kind of participants have the ability to commit or abort a given transaction. And the other type of Participants, some participants may support durable protocol. What is mean by that is those participants will use or manipulate some persistent data sources like databases and so on. So the next type is the volatile protocol. It is used by the participants which are manipulating some set of cache data or some uh, volatile data. So those are the three kind of sub-protocols which comes under 2PC coordination. Let's look at how this 2PC coordination protocol works. Here, you, okay, as you can see, uh, initiator send the create context request to the its own coordinator and coordinator will return the microtransaction context, that is the context that we have already talked about. And after that, initial phase is completed and actual business execution happens. An initiator has the ability to decide whether to commit or abort this transaction based on some external condition maybe. So what happens is, let's say initiator is saying, uh, instruct the coordinator to commit the transaction. So depend, after that, coordinator will talk to all the participant in this transaction in the background and come into a conclusion whether I can decide whether we can commit or abort. If any of these participants has some failures, then obviously we can't commit. The, then coordinator will decide to abort and it will return the state as aborted to the initiator. Likewise, let's say initiator has decided to abort the transaction based on some external condition. So at that point, coordinator will instruct all the participants to abort the transaction and that status will be returned to the initiator. This is the completion protocol which will run by the participant, participants who will have the ability to decide the end of the transaction. Basically, the initiator has this ability. And let's look at the other protocol. That is the durable protocol. This is what happens when initiator or some participant who has the ability to control the transaction, instruct the coordinator to commit, then in the background, coordinator has to communicate with all the participants. So at the first one, the coordinator do this is, it will send the prepare message to all the participants and it will return either prepared, read only, aborted or committed state. Prepared means the participant or that participant was able to successfully prepare and read only means that participant doesn't do any kind of update action and it is read only, it is performing some read only operations. So it can, uh, the coordinator basically can forget about that participants because no point of sending commit messages. And maybe participant got failed during its preparation, so it will return aborted. Likewise, 
the coordinator will receive the status of that preparation phase from each of the participants. And based on that return responses, then coordinator will analyze whether I can commit or not. If any of these participants got failed, then coordinator has to decide to abort. Or else, if all of them successfully prepared, coordinator will send a notification to all the participants to commit the entire transaction. And then participants will reply committed and so on. And if the coordinator decided to abort, it will send the notification to abort the transaction. This is how the uh, protocol messages flow in between coordinator and the participant during a commit phase. And let's say initiator has decided to abort and it will instruct the coordinator to abort the transaction. In that phase, in the background, coordinator will talk to the participants, all the participants, it will notify uh, abort message and participant will reply with aborted state. So this is how basically the two-phase coordination protocol works. The other type of coordination type is called the compensations. There can be situations we cannot apply this code two-phase commit scenario protocol in practically. Uh, for example, let's say we have some long-running transaction or else we are manipulating some non-recoverable resources like files. So in these kind of applications, we can't use normal transactions. We should have a way to compensate those actions performed by these types of transactions. So this is called the compensation protocol and those are comes under different coordination type. So actually this specification is not bound to any language or any underlying transport mechanism or anything else. So any language or anyone who implements this protocol need to support few commands. So these are the commands that I have already explained. The first one is create context, which is sent by the initiator to its coordination component. So as the return, as a return type of this message, it will send the microtransaction context, which will include some version number, that is the protocol version, and also a globally unique identifier, that is the unique identifier used for the entire transaction, and also the type of compensation used by the, or the supported by the coordinator, and also the registration URL for the coordinator, so in future participant can come and register. So this is what is written by the coordinator for the initial command. And the next command is, let's say some microservice received this transaction context in the incoming message. So it, have, it has to go ahead and register with the coordinator. So this is the register command. And input for this is obviously the same unique identifier because transaction, that service need to say that I'm going to register for this particular transaction and also exact protocol that service is supporting. That is, that can be, let's say, the coordination type is 2PC, then the participant may decide to support either completion, durable, or volatile, depending on the actions they are performing. So it will inform that to the coordinator. And also the participant protocol, that is the URL where coordinator can send messages to this particular microservice. So this is the registration flow. As the return, uh, return of that request, it, coordinator will send the microtransaction coordination context, which includes the same unique identifier and also a set of protocols where this microservice can interact with the coordinator. So this is how the registration works. This is the command that we need to implement if we are going to support this registration process. And the next one is, next command is the commit message. So this is initiated by the initiator. We need to instruct the coordinator to commit the transaction. So the input for that is the same identifier and output can be either committed, aborted or mixed. Mixed means some transact some services have decided to commit locally without waiting for the coordinator. So in that case the outcome will be mixed or else if there are, so are some errors occurred, it, the fault can be returned. So this is the commit message and Next one is the abort message. This is same as the commit message. The only difference is the command type. And the input is same, the same unique identifier. And finally, we have the prepare message. 
So prepare message, we have the same input, same identifier, and the output can be any of the four steps that I have already described, and also errors can be thrown during the execution if something unexpected happens. So the final step is notification, sending notification to the participants. So the notification can be either to commit or abort a transaction along with the same transaction ID. An output will be either committed or aborted, sent by the participant to that coordinator. So this is how that protocol works, and this is how we need to exchange messages between coordinator and the participants. So this is all about how we can implement transactions between microservices, and this specification, as I said earlier, is not bound to any kind of uh, language or any transport mechanism, but we have implemented it using Ballerina, this as a reference implementation, and also we have developed transaction sidecar. Let's say there is a service, some external service, which need to participate in the same business section. Uh, for example, Spring Boot application, it is talking to some MySQL database or some database, and we are, we are going to have a transaction or business execution, which participate that application also. In that case, what we need to have is a transaction sidecar, where it will act as a bridge between this transaction implementation and the Spring Boot application. So the transaction sidecar is the one which is get infected by this proce transaction process. So when initial coordinator send the prepare, prepare message, it will pass the, that information to the Spring application side. Likewise, any transaction implementation or any service which is supporting any other transaction mechanism can in get interact with this transaction as the participant. So that is what we call transaction sidecar. So we have implemented this using Ballerina, and I will quickly go through some imp implementation example. Here, some Ballerina source code, where we have a service at the top, and this is a uh, service resource. Uh, high initiator is the resource. The interesting part here is the transaction block we have here. So application developers or the someone who is going to develop a microservice don't need to care about all the details that I have described so far. All the underlying implementation like registration or uh, working with the coordinator or how we can send protocol messages, those are not actually visible to the application developer. Only thing they need to do is they need to define a transaction context as we, we have given here. The two curly brackets there between those two, you can provide any business execution which, which is going to happen during this transaction. So as you can see here, I'm going to call this get request to the service high. So that is like microservice one is talking to microservice two. So let's say that transaction got successful and at the end we have the committed block where it, the code here will get execute if the transaction is successful. And if let's say transaction coordinator has decided to abort the transaction and the code will reach to the aborted block where you can place any code block that you need to execute after the transaction failure. So what you can see here is actually business developers don't need to worry about any of the details that I have described. When we have a transaction block like this, Internally, it will initiate the coordinator and it, it will create the transaction context and the transaction context or that information in the transaction context will get injected this, to this action, that is the get action, HTTP get action. So all the information in the transaction context will be injected to that as HTTP headers. So when other service receiving this HTTP request along with that transaction headers, it will get to know that, okay, I'm going to participate a transaction. So we also have a retry count here, uh, which is specified as two. That means this transaction is retrying twice. And before retry, we have on retry block, you can place any code that you need to execute before the retry happens. So, so this is how initiator is working. And now let's look at how the participant side look like. Here you have to mention 
uh, I am going to participate in a transaction if there are any incoming transaction headers. So to inform that, I'm using a transaction participant annotation here. As you can see in the top, that is the annotation, and along with that, I'm giving two function pointers. Those are similar to the aborted and committed book block which we seen in the initiator. It's do the same thing because we need to get some notification after transaction is committed or aborted. So business developers only have to decide or write down their business functionalities and all the protocol messages and everything is not visible to the developer. So let's say incoming request came here to this high endpoint with some transaction headers. So at that point it detected there are some transaction headers. Internally because of that annotation, it will go ahead and register to that particular coordination URL. So internally, the process that I have described will happen and users don't need to worry about anything and automatically those microservices will be participating in the same transaction. So this is how we have implemented and this is all about this specification. And actually it is still under development as I said earlier. And if you have any questions, this is time to ask.